Well, good morning. And happy Mother's Day to you. It's a good day to come in the house of the Lord and worship God. And also, we'll take some time. We want to celebrate our mothers today. And as the men disappear outside, I'm just going to tell you, they're bringing a little gift for all the mothers. But this is for mothers. This is for those that hold a, a motherly uh, place in someone's life. This is for those of you that, that might look around and say, I've been like a mother to people. And as we're going to talk about in a little bit, there's even this category of like a spiritual parent helping people to spiritual maturity. And so this, is, this ends up encapsulating all the ladies, no, uh, no matter if we got enough, hopefully all the way down to the youngest. But they're going to bring in some flowers here. We got a gift for you. And while they do that, I'm going to give you the rest of the announcements. Okay. They all the fellowship all. Perfect. Okay. So here we go. So flowers are on the way. In your bulletin, uh, we got this tear off tab. And if you're a guest with us, we'd love uh, for you to fill that out so we can uh, know of more information about you. And looking in the bulletin, just some announcements to make sure you're aware of. The church office will be closed this coming week. And so if you, uh, if you need anything, you can call, leave a message, or you can call me on my phone, or um, you can email, or you can wait till next week. Whatever you want to do. Um, next Sunday, speaking of which, we're starting on Sunday evenings. We've got a children's uh, missions thing, and we call it children's music and missions. And they're going to sing a little bit and study missions. And um, at the same time, we'll have an adult Bible study in the fellowship hall. So if you've got some children, you want to bring them, you can drop them off and come study. And come, come on in and start handing them out. Um, and uh, that'll be starting next Sunday evening. And then notice vacation Bible school scheduled for June 12th to 16th. And you can mark your calendar for that.
All right, see, now I have to bring it back in after we've passed out flowers and cupcakes. So you're all, you're all just, everybody's lost your vote, you know. All right, here we go. Let's um, open in a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll sing together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Thank you for the gifts you give us. And we recognize that all the ladies in our lives in a variety of ways that they uh, influence us are all a gift. And so we're grateful for that as well. Today, as we worship, would you turn us towards this idea of following after Jesus and maturity? And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning. Hymn number 441, Take Time to Be Holy. Next hymn this morning is number 536, Happy the Home When God is There. Take some time to pray together today. 
And I want to tell you first about our missionary, Joe Brewster. He's down in Peru in South America. And there's um, about 50 indigenous people groups that live in Peru. And what I mean by that is that there are 50 different languages and 50 different cultures that are all independent from one another in that country of Peru. So when you send a missionary to Peru, it's not enough to just know Spanish. If you're going to reach into each of those people groups, you've got to know individual cultures and individual languages. Joe's a missionary down in Peru and um, working with a particular people group. And this people group looked around and said, look, we want to send our own missionaries. We want to send out to tell people about Jesus, but we don't have any money. What do we what do we do? And the plan they came up with was uh, Joe got some seed money through Southern Baptists and they built these fish farms, about nine fish ponds. And what they do is they raise these fish, they sell them, and they use the money to send their own missionaries. And so we sent one missionary and some seed money, and then it's multiplying with new believers there that are then finding their own ways to fund missions and going out from there. So far, they've sold nearly 18,000 pounds of fish. I don't know, it sounds like a lot, but maybe if you sell fish, it's not, but it sounds like a lot to me. And, and using that, those profits... Uh, to support their missionaries. I'm going to pray for Joe. And then uh, two others. We want to continue praying for Marie Powell, and um, she's at Fairmont, uh, but they're still really wrestling with figuring out the source of what's going on. And um, her issues are, are kind of getting worse, and, um, and she'll have good days and not so good days, and so I'm going to pray for them as they, they sort through that. And then lastly, um, the family of Sam Trent. And if you hadn't heard, Sam passed away last week. Um, His service is tomorrow here at the church. Visitation from 1130 to 1230, and then a service at 1. Let's uh, lift all these things to the Lord together. Father, what a blessing it is to hear about the work you're doing in Peru. And that we can send missionaries that can lead people to Christ, but then also that that movement there multiplies out and that they catch this vision of sending missionaries and we can be part of this movement that sends the gospel around the world. We would pray for them as they, they'd have opportunities to continue that work and you continue to bless that. We also lift up Marie and the family of Sam today and the things that they're walking through and ask for wisdom and comfort. We ask that we'd all be reminded in knowing that your presence is with us and that the greatest gift and our greatest hope is knowing salvation in Christ. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
<laughs> He's got it all figured out. <laughs> that song the choir sang gives us this picture of a mother's influence in a child's spiritual journey. The child remembers the content and tone of the prayers, and the child desires to um, move forward in life imitating that faith and, and wishes to hear again and, and look forward to the day when they worship together. We recognize our parents play an incredibly influential role in our lives. Of course, there's the time when they're raising us, and you know, oftentimes Nicole will say, why do I have to do this and why do I have to do that? And we'll say, it's our job to raise you and she'll roll her eyes and say it's not fair and you know but our parents are influential those that raise us whoever it was but even after we're grown they still play this this influential role but somewhere along the way we transition um, from being the child and we transition into adulthood and we reach this point where our parents are no longer responsible for our growth to maturity reach the point where they say, well, I've done what I can, good luck. And they, it was like, well, my parents dropped me off at college, and my, you know, my dad's like, all right, you got four years and one summer, that, and then if you mess it up after that, you're on your, you know, like, <laughs> good luck, <laughs> we've done what we can, and, you know, kind of going off. And there's a spiritual parallel in our spiritual growth to maturity. There tend to be people in our lives that, that lead us to faith, and people that care for us and teach us, share the gospel with us. But at a certain point, we move from someone else being responsible for that to us being responsible. So this is kind of what I mean by that. You, you have like, for instance, our preschool class that Nicole was in. We have wonderful preschool teachers. And Nicole would show up in that class, not because she desired it, but she did. Not because she could drive herself, she couldn't. She showed up because we said, you're gonna go to church. And she sat in the class, and she loved it, but it was, it was spoon-fed. But as she grows up, at some point, she's going to reach the point where she goes to church or participates in faith, not because we say this is what we're doing, but because she decides for herself. And we reach this point where it's up to us individually to determine our level of involvement in our, in our growth. And so we're looking at this passage this morning in Hebrews 5. And it's, it's a few short verses right in the middle of just a really interesting few chapters. And the author of Hebrews is teaching about Jesus as our great high priest, and he's covering these big, complicated theological topics that we're not even going to look at this morning. But the author takes this break right here in these, in these verses to basically rebuke his, his readers. And it's a specifically rebuke to them. It's not like specifically applied to us. We want to read this this morning about spiritual maturity as like a warning sign of we don't want to end up in that situation. We want to be able to um, look at difference. We let this be a warning to us, but see what we can learn from, from the situation these people were in. So we'll read with me Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Pray with me and we'll look in this passage together. Father, thank you for your word that we can learn. We ask this morning you'd open our eyes to see the truths that are here, that we can apply it to our lives, that we might um, be well equipped in our path to maturity. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. First thing I want you to see in here is that when we stop learning, we stop growing. And you look, and you know, it's interesting, the author's in this middle of this pretty intense section of teaching, and he kind of takes a pause here to say, man, I've got so much to explain to you. But he says in verse 11, you've become dull of hearing. It says, like, I, I've got so much to tell you, but you've, 
You've lost your ability to listen. And it's interesting, he's not insulting their intelligence. He's not saying they're not smart enough to understand. This isn't about capacity to learn. What he's saying is that you've neglected this skill of hearing and learning. The author has realized that their, their academic muscles have decayed to the point that he's writing this letter going, I want to explain this to you, but it's really difficult to figure out how to do it because you don't have the muscles there. Let me give you an example. If you think back to when you were in grade school, or maybe when you were in college or, or whatever, and you get to the end of your school year, and it's the last day, and you run home, and you throw your backpack in the corner, and you forget about school all summer long. Those were the good old days. And then school, it's time for school to start again, and you go pick the backpack up, take your old lunchbox that still got whatever was in it to your mom and say, thanks mom, could you deal with that? And then you go to school and you sit down the first day and the teacher says, all right, here's the syllabus or here's what we're doing or pull out a piece of paper or here's a test and you just groan because you're like, oh my goodness, like this again, are you serious? And then you're like, all right. And for those first like couple of days and because you've, you've kind of over summer break, you, you kind of lost that rhythm of learning. You lost that rhythm of what it means to show up ready to learn. But that summer break effect builds over time. That's why a lot of people don't take a year off between high school and college because they're worried that they just will never go back. That's why I went straight to seminary because I said if I stop, I'm not going back to academic learning. It's also, by the way, one of the two reasons why I'll never do a doctorate. Uh, one is because my wife gets to get the next uh, advanced degree in our household, and the other is because I've had enough of professional academia. But just because we're done with professional academia doesn't mean we can stop learning. It, it doesn't, we can't just go to summer break for the rest of our lives. In some cases, there are practical reasons. Like, I bet your high school didn't teach you how to do taxes. Like, at a certain point, you just have to, oh man, I gotta figure this out. You know, these types of things. But that the, the same is true in our spiritual lives. The spiritual growth and maturity. And it's like the author is saying here, look, I've been trying, I want to explain this to you. And I know that you know faith, but it's like you've been on summer break for like years. And you've lost this, this ability to, to know how to listen and how to learn. And because you've stopped listening and you've stopped learning, you've stopped growing. And so I'm trying to tell you these things, but you're not going to understand it. So the author wants them to get back to learning so they can get back to growing. The second in this passage, we want to see that passing time doesn't bring maturity. In other words, just time ticking along on our own doesn't bring maturity. And in case you're wondering, the author indeed is convinced that his audience had enough time to learn. Looking in verse 12, he says, By this time you ought to be teachers. In other words, you've had enough time to learn. You, if you put your mind to it, you'd know a whole lot more today. That You have this capacity to learn. You have this ability to learn. But if you, if you would put your mind to it, you could get somewhere. And the author is saying that's not the case. That you're not, you're not spiritual mature. You haven't reached this point. And the author says you're still a spiritual child. There's this metaphor he uses in, in verse uh, 12 and 13 saying you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he's a child. If you imagine the physical growth of a child, and we track along, the spiritual growth is parallel. Child, when they're born, starts on milk. Like, that's it. Milk, formula, like, just pure liquid. And then slowly you introduce the solid foods. Like, they, we had this stuff that they tried to call oatmeal, but it wasn't. It was these little flakes of, like, thickener. And the first time we gave it to Nicole in the little bowl and we tried to give it to her and she just kind of spit it back out. Like, what is, this isn't milk, what are you giving me? What are, like we have to pull them along and then you slowly go to the pureed foods and you give them the pureed peas that you're like, I wouldn't touch if I had to. And they're like, gobble it up because they love it. And they keep going and then one day you wake up and you're having dinner and, and you're eating the food and the child says, can I have a bite of your steak? And you're like, oh man, it's over now. Sure, here you go. Now I gotta share. 
Okay? But you kind of pull them along. But then what happens? Eventually they grow older and older. And then one day, you're not, they, they have more influence in what they want to eat. I'm not going to eat that. And then they go older and they older. And then they get to the point, like I did when I got to my seminary apartment and there wasn't a dining hall and the cabinets were empty and family wasn't around. And I thought to myself, well, now what am I going to eat? So you get to the point where it's your job. You got to go to the store and figure out what am I going to make? And you got to, I don't know, like, how do you make a meal? What do you do? You have to learn these things. I know how to make pancakes. Does that count? Right? Like you just, you, cause there's this transition. The same is true spiritually. We start off with this spoon fed in the, in the younger classes with children, or we start off with these basic truths like God loves us and Jesus died and rose again and have faith to be saved and, We start off with these simple stories like David and Goliath and Noah and Jonah. Start off when we, if we want to hear the story again, we go and say, oh, tell me again about Jonah and the whale or tell me again, what was it? 5,000 they fed and you, you hear these stories and, but at a certain point, you reach the point in your life where if you're going to learn more, nobody's going to spoon feed it to you. Like, nobody's going to drag you into a classroom and sit you down and be like, guess what we're learning today? Like, you just, it's up to you. You have to decide what you're going to do. And then it's that transition from where your faith goes from being owned by your parents to being owned by yourself. It's this transition to, to spiritual maturity and spiritual adulthood. And the author is saying to these people, you spent a whole lot of time just eating, drinking spiritual milk. Spent a whole lot of time with nothing but the basics. And you've had a whole lot of time to be able to grow towards maturity. And he's saying, man, what a shame that you're stuck here with spiritual milk when there is steak and chicken and fish floating out there. Like if you only knew. And he's trying to describe them these things and say, this is, this is good stuff. You want to know this. But man, you're still stuck on the milk. Notice he doesn't say it's impossible to live on milk as a spiritual child. But that's kind of the implication here. And, and at the end of the day, we have to look around and acknowledge that it's possible to get saved on spiritual milk. But fruitfulness comes from growing into maturity. But what's happened here is he's pointing out that just because you got saved one day and then sat there doing nothing doesn't mean maturity comes. The same is true in our own lives worked with college students from time to time that are like on year seven and they're like in an apartment racking up student loan debt. I mean, just hand over fist, taking one class at a time, playing video games 35 hours a week. And you're just like, like you're, you're not going to get to the point of graduation like at that pace. You're not going to grow into, like you're just going to wake up one morning and boop, I'm a small business owner at full adulthood maturity with my own. You have to work towards it. And it's the same spiritually. You have to work towards it and learn and, and go on. Starting off with the spiritual milk and moving to the maturity. Passing time doesn't bring maturity. When you stop learning, you stop growing. The author gives them the solution and as so we're headed towards is that maturity comes by working at it. He gives this kind of identifying mark of those that reach maturity, saying that the mature are those who have been trained by constant practice. Your translation, if you use the New King James, I actually really like the way it describes it. It says, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. In other words, he's saying these mature, the, the, what he would hope would be true for these people are the ones that have moved from spiritual milk to solid food. And it's a practice, it's by using it, it's having the skill of listening and learning and using it and exercising it continually over time. And saying that this, this would be maturity if you're working at it and using the skills and keep working at it. There's things like Bible study and prayer we call the spiritual disciplines. And when I first heard that, I was like, well, that seems like an odd word to use. But you make the connection to this passage, you see, ah, it's a discipline because you have to kind of fight to do it. Like, you have to push yourself to do it. It's a discipline. There's like a thousand things that demand our attention every day. 
So if we're going to be in our Bibles and reading and studying, we have to be intentional about it. Like you have to stop and say, I know I could watch this game or that game, or I could do this or do that, and I know the mulch needs to be spread and these things, and I know that I'm tired and the kid's going to want this. To pick a time and be intentional and say, this is where Bible study can happen. There are a thousand distractions all around us, and 95% of them we carry in our pockets. But if we're going to be about prayer, we have to be intentional. No matter how much money we make or how many possessions we have, we'll never have enough to feel like we've got all the things. And so if we're going to honor the Lord with our giving and our tithes and offerings, then we have to be intentional about it. We have to budget for it. If we wait until the end of the month and say, I'll write a check for whatever might be left, you're going to realize that you've got more month than you have check, and you're saying, can I send you a, a little bit of month, right? College ministry, we would talk about this as the context of helping students become self-feeders. This college is right at this time of this faith transition and helping them understand that they're at the point where nobody's going to spoon feed it to them anymore. Nobody's going to drag them anywhere. And they need to learn how to study scripture and make application on their own, join a local church and arrive mentally ready to engage with what's going on. And the same is true for all of us. This is ongoing, lifelong decision. Because we don't want to reach the point of spiritual maturity and solid food and then say, well, that's good enough, and then regress and just live off spiritual milk the rest of our lives. Like, would you want to come to the point of being able to eat steak and going, nah, I'm good. Just pass the, the milkshake and I'll be good to go. But we come at this from another angle because I want to recognize that at the very least, all of you are here this morning. So all of you have taken the time to say, I'm going to take time to worship. I'm going to take time to study. I'm going to take time to pray. All of you have said, I'm not content to just remember Jesus loves me and move on with my life, right? You're all here in this room. So I want to come at this from another angle and say, okay, as the spiritually mature, as we're all growing, we never reach maturity entirely. We're always working towards it. We can teach others what we've been taught. The proverb says, iron sharpens iron, meaning we can help one another get to maturity. We can look at those that are on spiritual milk and say, there's something better. There's more to learn. There's encouragement here. There's maturity here. Some different applications for this, and um, the greatest one I want us to look at and think about is we have this urgent responsibility to pass our faith down to the next generation. And always be thinking about those that come after us and how we can start with the spiritual milk, but then help them move into spiritual maturity. And the truth of the matter is we have to teach every generation everything all over again. Like every generation that comes up starts with a baseline of knowing nothing. Maybe they've got influence from their parents. Maybe they've got influence from friends. But at some point, everyone has to learn everything. And maybe 50 years ago, it was far more common for people to be in church and hear stories of Scripture. It's not as common anymore. It's far more common to run into someone on a college campus that has no idea what you, say, what you mean when you say David and Goliath than it is to say, oh, yeah, the... Shepherd, a slingshot, yeah, big guy, got it. So we have to teach all these things, but, but see, here's the thing. We can't just teach the application. We can't just teach the end game because the world is changing so quickly and culture is changing so quickly that the way we apply scripture to our lives looks different every passing year and decade. The, the world we live in now in 2022 is radically different from what it was like when we started the church in 1898. And so if we tried to say, we're going to take all of the spiritual truth application in 1898 and apply it today, you would, you'd say, that's just, that's just crazy. Like if we tried to copy everything about how we minister from then here, you'd say, that's just great. We would say, well, there's no air conditioning anymore because in 1998, right? Like we have, to, we have to remember why we do things and teach why and the concepts underneath it so that it can be applied consistently throughout time. Let me give you a, an illustration. We taught our daughter how to add 
a little bit, kind of, but not really, because Elon teachers can teach and, and we, we can't. But we tried. And so one day I was trying to teach Nicole how to add, and I said, look, here's the concept of adding. You've got one, and you've got one. And if you add one plus one, you get two. And she's like, what? And then, okay, so then you go on and you say, okay, she kind of begins to understand there's this concept of a numerical unit and a numerical unit, and together they, they kind of, and then you get, learn the numbers, and, and then so we said, okay, if you have two, and you add one, and you, she's like, one, two, you have three. Because you're learning the concept underneath the math. If we just said, you need to memorize that two plus one equals three, and she didn't get the concept, then she wouldn't have been able to come to us one day and say, mommy, daddy, guess what? Four plus four is eight. You see, it's a, sim- it's a simple and silly example, but you understand the concept underneath it, and then you know how to apply it yourself, and you can arrive at the answer without having to be spoon-fed everything. And when we teach scripture to people, we teach biblical concepts to people, we have to dig down to the concept, because at every turn, when we say, this is what the Bible says, the question, especially with the upcoming generation, is going to be this. Why? Let me give you an example. This one's a lot more serious. One of the most common questions you get on a college campus is, what does the Bible say about alcohol? Now, if the question was, what does the Bible say about stealing, it'd be a whole lot easier to answer. Thou shalt not steal. Done. Period. But it's not that simple. There is no single verse you can point to and say, there it is. So the Bible says, done. So when you answer the question, if you just give them the blanket bottom line answer, they're going to look at you and say, why? And you might even have the answer in your head. You might be thinking to yourself, well, this is easy. I'm, I'll tell you exactly what the Bible says about alcohol. It says, bloop, and there it is. But the question when you teach it is going to be, why? So when you answer this question to students, and you're trying to teach this, we have to go to like five or six different passages, and you have to explain, this is where Scripture has black and white teachings. This is where Scripture's got these principles that are kind of gray area you have to apply. This is what it says about this concept and this concept. And you build that to say, so then when we approach the issue of alcohol, we take all these things into consideration, and the Bible's teaching on alcohol is bloop. And they go, oh, okay. And they dig into it, and they dig into it, because it's based on Scripture, not based on what we say. So as we move forward then, you might say, okay, but that's, but like, why, like, why go through all that? Like, teaching, like, why, why deal with all that? And the answer is because the same as the simple with the adding. If we try to make Nicole memorize addition tables for every single like possible addition formula, like she'll never get there. And it just consistently be this struggle of not understanding it. And it's the same true spiritually. If they don't understand why, what the biblical principles are, then when something happens like, say, marijuana ends up being legalized, and it's happened in some states, and I mean, you look far enough out, it's likely to happen in our nation. Then college students are going to say, but what does the Bible say about marijuana? And what what we want them to be able to do is to already know and look and say, my faith is based on Scripture. What are the principles in Scripture that I can apply to this? Because alcohol might be mentioned in Scripture a few times, right? Like Jesus turned water into wine and don't be drunk and all these things. But marijuana is nowhere. Like it's not in there at all. So you're all just working off principles. And so as we teach this, the solid food and this, we try to bring to spiritual maturity. We've got to teach everything all over again. We have to recognize that our culture is changing so quickly that it's not good enough to just say, this is the, what the Bible says, boom. We've got to dig all the way down and, and give them why it says that and where that comes from so they can take that and then apply it out in other things. I got rolling there. Okay, and then, and this is the, the other part of this application we can think for ourselves here. As we consistently teach down to the next generation, we've got to be constantly looking and saying, how can we help them into spiritual maturity? 
Because if, if we end up one day with a church full of people that are all stuck on spiritual milk, if our church is this, all on spiritual milk, then there ends up being no one around to give the bullet point answer. And then they don't know what to do. And you slowly have less people in spiritual maturity, and then you end up lost. And so we have to look and say that we have this responsibility here to pass faith down and help them understand what the Bible says, but why it says it, as help them develop their own faith and go from the spiritually immature on spiritual milk and gain that independence and spiritual maturity moving forward onto solid food so they can teach someone else and they can teach someone else and they can teach someone else. And then one day when we all get to heaven and we can look around and find the believers that are members of this church in the year 24 whatever, assuming that the Lord doesn't return before then, and say, how is it in First Baptist Monroe? And they can say, ah, we are a church full of mature believers. And we can say, ah, I'm glad that we did our part passing the maturity down. We bear this responsibility to exercise our ability to listen and learn, to be disciplined towards our spiritual growth, to move from milk to solid food, but also to raise up the next generation in faith and continue pushing the pattern forward. When you stop learning, you stop growing. Passing time doesn't bring maturity. Maturity comes by working at it. Let's pray with me. Father, thank you for this warning that we can look at and say, we don't want to be like that. We want to be a people that are trained by constant practice, a people that focus on you, a people that look to scripture, and a people that pass it on to the generation coming after. Would you help us to do that? Show us the ways we can do that. Show us how we can help people to understand the greatness of your mercy and your grace. And all these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I came up with this um, tagline for this scripture passage and what we talked about, if you want to remember it, um, it's maturity doesn't just happen by time passing. You're responsible for it. But it's Mother's Day, and what I really came up with was this one because it's Mother's Day, and I know you got, all got it on your minds. Your mom is not responsible for your growth anymore. You are. Get on out of the apartment and go buy some food. Right? All right. This last song we're going to sing, uh, number 389, More About Jesus. It's got this idea. We are always pushing to learn more about Jesus, more about God. We twist our mind and our heart that direction towards Jesus. Let's sing together. Let's stand and sing.
Make sure you tell your mama or mother figures or daughters or whoever it is, happy Mother's Day today. Don't get in trouble. You all have a good week and go in the love of the Lord. Choir is going to sing our benediction.